This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. Mark, I don't know what your camera is doing, but it is behaving interestingly. Uh, greetings, and let me turn on transcript. There we go. Um, I was just describing the McMenamin family, uh, which are a Oregon Pacific Northwest kind of phenomenon. And um, they're one of the reasons why April and I kind of moved to Portland. <clears throat> and in, uh, in 2015, uh, we had an engagement with Nike to come here and do some work. And then uh, we stayed at Airbnbs in the Northwest part of Portland. And on our way out on one of the early trips, we stopped at a place we'd heard of called the Kennedy School. And we're like, what's that? And it turns out that there's this uh, Kennedy grade school a mile south of PDX, a mile south of the airport, so sort of in the northeast part of town. And not John F. Kennedy. This is actually a different Kennedy who was a teacher uh, at that school. And this McMenamin family, which has been picking up a, like abandoned properties and refurbishing them and making them beautiful, had turned a grade school into a hotel, a restaurant, two or three bars, a bowling alley, a uh, little movie theater, and I'm missing something. I think a little spa. <laughs> and that, that this was just a grade school. And you walk around and they have an aesthetic that is basically too many chandeliers, all, all pretty dim. So it's not really bright. Everything has kind of got a low aesthetic. They have a, if you took the best of 60s psychedelic art and married it to some other kind of aesthetic, I'm not exactly sure what it is. That's their aesthetic. And, uh, the sister is two brothers and their sister, the McMenamins. I'll put a link in the in the chat in a sec. And it's just uh, like one of my beliefs now is that every region, every city or state should have a McMenamins sort of family because they they make whatever they touch revives the neighborhood. And uh, we have Australian friends who moved to Seattle just pre-pandemic and then moved back to Australia because pandemic, <clears throat> but they they became addicted to McMenamins properties. So we met them at the Anderson School up uh, up towards Seattle. And, um, and the Anderson School apparently revived the neighborhood. Like wh where it stands now, there's a whole bunch of buildings that weren't there when they went in and uh, they really caused the change. So anyway, little pay in to, uh, to uh, rehabbing older properties. So the McMenamins will take over old churches. There's a Masonic temple that's walking distance from us, which is now a dinner movie theater that's, that shows odd movies, uh, all, all, all different kinds of things. And their biggest property, their, their signature property is called Edgefield, which is about 20 minutes east of PDX of the airport here, and used to be the poor farm in uh, Portland. So it was where when they when people fell into poverty, they sent them out to the poor farm to sort of work for uh, sustenance in some sense. And then it, that got closed down. I don't know when that or the story behind it. So it was the property was idle for a while. It might have been an asylum for a while. Don't know. And then the McMenamins went and bought it and turned Edgefield into a large perf outdoor performance venue with a beautiful sloping field and a big stage, uh, a hotel, uh, several restaurants, a vineyard, and multiple other things. You can go look at their website and see what's up. So it, it's it's impressive. Like like the whole little agglomeration really uh, brings joy to our hearts. And and I, there's a little selfie week that April and I took as we left the Kennedy School uh, back in 2015. And we took a selfie in front of the sign outside of the school. And we were just like smiling and looking at each other going, any city that has a lot of these has got something interesting going for it. So. Um, we are in check-in mode. This is the alternating week for check-ins. We tested Doug's uh, check-in process uh, two weeks ago. I don't think Doug's going to make this call. I'm not sure. And Mark has his hand up before I go any further. So please. And you're, you managed to lower your hand, but not unmute yourself. And, and if we can modify the protocol a little bit, keep your hand up when you're speaking so that you stay in the upper left-hand corner of our Zoom gallery views. Otherwise, you float off into some other place in the in 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 our view, and we have to hunt for you. So, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, it was recently pointed out to me that I was treating the Internet Archive like family, and uh, as uh, my friend said, acting a little too mergy. Um, and uh, it was kind of pointed out that yeah. Um, 
it's not a family, um, kind of inappropriate to kind of uh, um, look at that. But um, having lost both parents um, and uh, distant with uh, my siblings, I'm kind of thinking, huh, what kind of family, like the um, uh, family you mentioned, um, makes sense in terms of, you know, um, maybe creating an organized crime family. Um, and I joke at crime, but basically, you know, something like uh, um, the group in the book um, uh, Cryptonomicon that basically says, okay, we're going to have descendants. Um, you know, we know where there's buried Nazi gold. Let's, let's get it. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, do I try to, you know, so I'm starting a group called Team Best Friends, um, which is, you know, various levels of trust boundaries and, you know, smart, sexy people um, having uh, open home office hours every Saturday with a party with a campfire every Saturday to kind of get people together and kind of throw this idea out. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking, you know, uh, OGM is developing into kind of sort of, you know, different brother kind of sister types of possible relationships. Anyway, I'm throwing that out um, because you brought up the family and certainly I don't, you know, <laughs> inherit um, <laughs> property or, or, uh, <laughs> you know, feel uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, part of this wealthy stream that people build in heritage and um, uh, ancestry and descendants. Anyway, um, uh, it's a thought. Um, and yeah, I don't exactly know where to go with uh, some of these things, but uh um, don't want to act appropriately like OGM is my family, if that certainly is is uh, the case. Thanks. Mark, thank you. It's a lovely, lovely way to open our conversation. I really appreciate that. Um, two small thoughts. One is this notion of family of choice, which I have always loved. And sometimes you're just born into um, the, the your birth lotto ends you up in a place that's not hospitable to who your soul is somehow. Uh, and finding your way to the people who you care about as if they were family, and to a more or less explicit extent, connecting with them in those roles and in those ways is really cool. And I think it saves a lot of people to know that they have a, a family of choice. And extending on that at some point, I, I thought of the idea of a nation of choice. And I think we might be moving into a world where national boundaries are superseded. This is actually my sort of idealized thinking. And we can we, we sort of affiliate with nations of choice that have regimes. And you could think of Burning Man as a nation of choice or the Rainbow Coalition or who knows what else. There's probably some really negative ones you could think of as well as nations of choice that are people's primary philosophical affiliation in some sense. And then last quick thing, there was a magazine I used to subscribe to called Granta, which was kind of a literary journal, came out, I think, quarterly. My favorite episode of Granta on the cover, it said family, colon, they fuck you up. And then the first essay was, um, I'm forgetting, oh God, uh, Gary Mark Gilmore, the um, assassin, uh, his brother wrote the first essay in that issue of Granta. And it was about how they grew up. And it's like, ooh, ah, wow. Um, so there we go. The, the thing I was gonna ask was, I don't know how many of us were on this call two weeks ago. I wanted to debrief a little bit on what was different or better or worse for you from the way we ran it uh, in Doug Carmichael's serious conversations process. So uh, raise your hand if you were here two weeks ago. Okay, that's about what I thought. So so most of us, I guess. Um, <clears throat> hi, Klaus. And um, any thoughts, any feedback? Uh, better, worse, uh, slower, faster, try it again, tune it, tweak it. Um, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a, a nice break, nice change. Um, I appreciated Doug's interventions, you know, st stick to a point, what's on your mind and hearing what 
was going on from people. I, I liked it a lot. Thank you. Pete, then Hank. Um, I, I appreciated, uh, I appreciated the difference. Um, and, uh, I, I have a, I have a reaction, which I don't mean to overweight, um, by saying it, but, um, I ended up feeling like, uh, it was not fast enough. Like we, we usually, we can do super fast calls, which is fun and bad in, in ways, um, uh it, and it felt like it wasn't slow enough either it, i didn't feel enough contrast between our, our regular calls um, i really did appreciate doug's um and and a big part of it was just uh when people started wandering off too much uh, maybe like i'm doing right now uh doug kind of pulled him back um but anyway it, it was it was a good experiment um and i would like to see it go even further um interestingly enough thank you um, and Scott, for those of you who weren't on the call two weeks ago, <clears throat> um, Doug used to run a salon series in Palo Alto, somebody who, and uh, uh, I think a couple of us used to actually attend. I think John Kelly used to attend uh, now and then, so he's not on this call, but he could report back on what it was like. But he used to run a, a salon series called Serious Conversations, <clears throat> and his approach was, at the beginning, we want to hear from everybody in the room, but you need to be brief and you're answering the prompt. Uh, what, and I'm gonna get the prompt wrong, I'll look it up, uh, or if somebody can look it up faster than me, uh, what, what is a topic serious enough that we should talk about it uh, together? And then at the end of the check-in where everybody was heard from, and the, the idea was on purpose to quickly hear from everybody, then you would sort out what topic to go into and, and keep talking from there. So there'd be no interruptions, no, uh, you know, no tangents off of whatever came up as people were busy doing their check-ins. And the, the thing he added to it, which is something that's often used, is when you're done with your check-in, <clears throat> you pick the next person to check in. That's the process. Hank? Yeah, uh, I also think it's a, a good way to experiment with these calls. Uh, as I have mentioned on a lot of... Uh, uh, previous calls, I'm working with a concept uh, with Leif Edvinson, David Gurdine, and some others called Oracy Labs. We're struggling with turn taking and uh, people uh, going off on tangents before everyone checks in. Uh, and we don't have a good answer to it, except that there should be a host which is just a word that we call uh, someone who's taking responsibility, who tries to wear two hats at the same time, uh, both as a participant and an observer of what's going on. Uh, I think for a group like OGM, it's extremely important to allow people to go off on tangents, but at least have some structure uh, in it so that everyone can be heard and that people who are waiting to contribute can contribute at the point at the moment when they're uh, what they have to say is relevant. So I think it's worth experimenting uh, with as much as uh, as people on the call can take. I think it's uh, if you want to destructure conversations, you do need a little structure to begin with. Thanks, Hank. And I like very much the idea of us uh, playing with format, experimenting with the, the different kinds of things we do as well. So happy to do that. <clears throat> um, any other comments or thoughts on the serious conversations format? And I put the proper prompt in the chat, which is what's on your mind that's worthy of serious conversation, um, is what he says. Yeah. Um, and the issue of Granta was not that one. Uh, but Ken, the one that you put in is Granta 158. This is actually Granta 37, it turns out, because I was Googling while we were talking. I only found a Goodreads version of it, but I will paste that here. <laughs> so it's it's actually this one. Uh, Scott, go ahead. I was not here for this, and this question just jumped out at me. So what's on your mind that's worthy of serious conversation? I don't think I know anyone that I could sit down with and that would be my opening line because I would get the eye roll and 
I just want to hang out. We're just having coffee together. We're just whatever it is. Oh, it's good to see you. Let's just talk, talk about whatever. And my, as, as you know me well enough, my interest would be in, if someone asked me that, I would light up. You would see me just, I don't know. Yeah, this, yeah, let's let's go deep on something. Um, so for me, that's something that I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I, I'll be honest. I do think of this group as sometimes like, wow, I can't follow you guys because you're just, you're going deep on everything. You know, <laughs> every topic we're just we're just going, 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 and so. But it's the only group that I know of that that actually does that. Um, or one of the very, very few, and definitely not in person. So it's something I definitely do appreciate about this group is that that seems to be a, a similar mindset. So when someone says, hey, what's what's worthy of having a deeper conversation about? Most of us perk up as opposed to say, oh, that sounds hard, I'm tired, I don't want to think. So that's my thought. Thank you. Anybody else have a similar reaction? Cool. I, I do, but I won't repeat what Scott said. He did it well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Um, cool. So shall we proceed in our usual, normative, traditional, <clears throat> OG fashion? <clears throat> or shall we go back to a check-in with no comments at all? And um, what is your path? I'm happy to go with what's uh, what everybody would like to try. Or should we try experimenting with something different? Nobody has strong feelings. There being no strong I do. I have, I have, a, I have you, some, maybe something to try. If somebody were to go and instead of calling on the next person or instead of having a person in the queue, we just have a little bit of silence and see if somebody feels called to directly follow that person because what they have to say is actually somewhat connected. So modified Quaker meeting, sort of. Sort of, and if, like, no, if nobody <clears throat> within you know, a few seconds, you know, we're all looking at each other, then somebody could just, okay, well, I'll go then, you know, that type of thing. I like, this, <laughs> I like this a lot. And I think that we valued silence between uh, expressions very highly. So I think that automatically brings silence in in a really nice way. So I'm good with that. Pete? Um, uh, I wanted to ask, Jerry, you said modified Quaker meeting. And I just wanted to kind of check in with what you saw as the modification of that, um, how, it's, how it's modified. Sure. Um, so for everybody who hasn't been to a Quaker meeting, Quakers meet for an hour on Sundays. They come in, there's no iconography, nobody, in most meetings, nobody reads anything from the Bible, there's no sermon. Everybody just comes in and sits down and centers themselves. And then for the hour, it's like an hour of silent meditation, except <clears throat> uh, it's punctuated now and then randomly by members of the meeting, normal everyday attendees who stand up and have a message for the meeting. And they didn't prepare the message. They don't read it. They don't memorize it. It's something that wells up. Uh, it's, it's called speaking from the light, if I remember. <clears throat> and uh, there's a, a few little protocols about, about it. One of which is um, if somebody has just spoken, go quiet and soak with it. So the majority of meaningful worship is silence. It wouldn't be like the call that we're planning to do. That's one way that, that this would be different. And then the, one, one of the other kind of ground rules is you don't respond to other messages. So as opposed to what Stacey just proposed, which is like, if we go into silence, whoever's moved to join in from what was just said, which sounds like a great protocol, it's different from quicker meeting in that sense, in the sense that you're not really, the, the, the messages during meeting are not meant to be a conversation around a topic or anything like that. They're just supposed to, uh, you know, come spring forth in some sense. So those are the two ways I can think of that, that this would be different. Does that make sense? You're welcome, Pete. Uh, Mr. Carranza. Um, again, good morning. Um, basically, um, one of the things that um, as a software development team in stand-up meetings, we found to be incredibly useful and time-saving is there is no order. Um, <clears throat> somebody volunteers to go first, and then we popcorn is the term, um, and the person who's speaking um, can choose some silence after there's talk, and then they say, 
um, next to Klaus. And then Klaus would say next, and he would pick somebody um, after he speaks. And so there's, <laughs> oh, here's that video thing again. There's no um, uh, order um, except, you know, the person who's speaking chooses the next person, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody has to pay attention to whether they're going to be picked next and who hasn't been already picked. So it really has a focus on um, listening and remembering who's spoken and who's not. And it, works. and it goes really fast because there's no, because we know um, to go to the next person immediately. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, funny enough, in my experience, asking people to choose the next person and to try to remember who has already gone, especially as the group gets up a wee bit larger than this, winds up being confusing to people or people miss that mark a lot. <laughs> it, it's it's uh, people. It's sort of, it, and it's sort of difficult, I think, for people to be centered and to report from themselves and then to sort of snap back to, oh, who's in the group and who's next and whatever. Uh, but I've, I've used that protocol a bunch before myself. So okay. I agree with the difficulties and, um, you know, it's always been um, everybody chips in and says, oh, I've already gone or, you know, these people haven't gone. It's uh, it seems like a group kind of care uh, thing. Anyway, thanks. Totally agree. And the, and the valuable cheat is everyone who hasn't spoken yet, please hold up your hand or some other signal. Um, Klaus, then Stacey. Yeah, I'm sort of uh, reflecting, listening in here. Does everybody else feel the same way then that that information is just coming at you in a fire hose and you just don't know where to put it anymore? Um, I mean, I'm preparing for this webinar in, in less than two weeks and the the just just to digest and narrow down the conversation, you know, condense the conversation down to where you can actually really make sense and move the needle into a different place it is absolutely <clears throat> amazing you know to see the energy uh, with so many people i think being alerted or, or feeling a sense of alert um wanting to do something wanting to engage wanting to change but don't quite know where to go and maybe it's just me but the the um the, the, the pace of learning, you know, the pace of information that is that is uh, that is evolving around us, is extremely difficult to keep up with, and it's, I mean, for for whatever field you're working in, I'm in the food sector, right, of the economy, but that is enormous. I mean, the complexity of of uh, uh, going, what we're calling like farm to fork, right, and all the stations in between, you're getting into culture, you're getting into history, you're getting into emotions, right? It is absolutely uh, overwhelming. So, um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just a little bit like Mark here wandering <laughs> around. But uh, uh, I, I, just, I just see the need to to find a moment, you know, of rest and and uh, and uh, uh, the ability to 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 um, perspective to gain perspective. I think that's what we're really searching for, right? Is perspective. So yeah, um, so maybe it's we're making it more complicated than it has to be, right? So if we can just uh, um, if we can just uh, share, you know, not so much this technical stuff, but what is what is perspective? Where do where where are we at this moment in time? Because the world's going pretty crazy around us. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, the 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 uh, um, and and when you stay in a global context, right? When you watch uh, the, the observe, you know, in a global context, what's happening around us, and the aggressive and, and aggressiveness, and the you know the panic that is that is gripping uh, in in uh, in uh, several regions, which is starting to impact us here. It's so so maintaining perspective is incredibly difficult at this time and. So yeah, so I have this moment of wow, where am I? I'm so overwhelmed, you know, with so much stuff going on. So I'm going to treat what Klaus just said as the 
first entry in the process that Stacy described for us and ask us to go silent for a moment after it. Uh, then I will go to Stacy and Ken who are currently in my queue, but after each one, let's go a little quiet. And then I think the way to sort of step in will be to raise your hand so that you automatically get into the queue. That should work okay. And despite the, the request for silence, I think I'm gonna say, use the chat as openly and freely during this whole session as you wish. Um, use that to comment in ways you might have had I been taking us into digressions or whatever else. That'll work fine. And that will also uh, exhaust a few of the people who want to jump in and comment the way Stacy was describing. So then we'll sort of slow the, the wordy conversation down a little bit. Uh, because I think in particular, the thing you're pointing to, uh, Klaus, that we're drowning in the info torrent is uh, silence is one nice way to manage a piece of that. Um, so with that, let me go into a little silence and Stacy, you bring us up, please. That, that's actually perfect because I was going to modify what I said and said, maybe if we want to follow, we should raise our hands and then the facilitator can choose. So that's perfect. But I want to go back to that because what I see is part of the really great things about all these calls, not just in our groups, but in other groups, is human beings are getting a chance to practice sensing. We, I mean, I've seen the listening skills increase. The way people listen on calls is not the way we were listening two, three years ago. If you look at the calls and you watch the conversations, they're different. And part of that is many of us are learning ourselves when to speak, when not to speak. And that's why I think that it would be better for somebody to sense into themselves if they want to go next and then raise their hands. I think this should be a practice ground for us to getting used, you know, to get used to ourselves while we're speaking. Thank you. Very happy this topic of attention has uh, come up. Um, it's been on my mind a lot lately. I had, um, uh, in my misspent youth, I went to a lot of rock concerts and I uh, used to work in a blues club and stand in front of a stack of speakers all night long. And I listened to music on headphones way loud and I'm paying for it now. Uh, my audiologist said, uh, the kind of hearing uh, loss you have is very similar to sun damage. You get it when you're young and then it shows up when you're older. And so um, I went to, uh, I belong to Kaiser, I went and had uh, some hearing tests and I was told that I have uh, severe to profound hearing loss in my left ear in certain ranges. And um, I carried that around for about six weeks, like, oh, this is, you know, and I also, there's a really big difference to my left ear and my right ear. So um, uh, actually I had an MRI to see if there was a problem was like, you know, maybe heading for Meniere's disease. And I was just like really under like, oh God, you know, this is heavy duty stuff. And then uh, I went to Costco to get uh, hearing aids because they have really good quality hearing aids at very good prices. And the person there ran more tests, the same tests that Kaiser did plus some more. And she said, I have no idea why they told you you have severe to profound loss. You have moderate to severe in a certain range in your left ear, but you you have 100% on word recognition. Your hearing is not nearly as bad as they told you it is. And I felt like this weight had been lifted off of me because no longer was I carrying around a narrative of I'm losing my hearing. I was like, I've got average hearing loss for someone of my age who had my background. And um, so that's a very personal kind of, uh, what am I listening to? What am I attending to? What am I, what am I focusing on? And then I was reading um, an article, I think I posted to the OGM list that there's no indication that authoritarianism in, is on the rise and democracy is, is failing. In fact, there's very little empirical evidence to support that. It's a common media narrative, but when you look at the empirical evidence, it does not show up. So it reminds me of this story, which may be apocryphal, but I think it's a useful story that, you know, in the Tour de France, there's still these old bridges that have the, the the timbers that run lengthwise, you know, with the road, and there's spaces between them. And bicyclists were, you know, going off the off the wood into and crashing and having all kinds of problems. And so the the sports psychologist said the key to crossing the bridge is to aim high. Don't look down. Don't look. If you look, you're gonna go into the hole. Don't look down. 
So what are we looking at? Are we looking at where we want to go at, um, Yes, there's a tremendous increase in information. It's doubling. I don't know what the rate of information doubling is, but it's it's you know kind of like Moore's law. It, it keeps speeding up. But there's still the same relational rules, the same way of relating to people that has been around for as long as people have been around. And that's where I think if we focus our attention of how do I relate to people in the midst of this overwhelm, in the midst of this huge influx of new information, I still have to figure out how am I going to talk to the person in the store and what am I going to do to negotiate with my wife in order to, you know, uh, have a good relationship here? And, and how do I relate to my friends when they're feeling overwhelmed? Those things have not changed. And I don't think we spend enough time attending to that. And I have a suggestion for those who feel overwhelmed by information to immerse yourself in the emotional stream of your life and the way in which you feel the, the, resonance or disharmony with your friends. And you might find that that's um, a way out of feeling overwhelmed by information and, and moving into a, a better way of how can I focus on aiming high, getting across that bridge without going into the hole and helping people to, to not look at all the negatives because we're surrounded by so much negative press. And um, that to me is worse than the the load of information is just how much of it is negatively focused when we need to be focused on um, what's positive, what we can build on, what's working, what's going to actually allow us to get through the eye of this needle. Thank you. I wanted to mention that uh, a concept that helped me a lot um, with information overload or, or feeling overloaded by information maybe it's a better way to say it, um, is, is the concept of self-care. Um, this was something that I learned about from, oddly enough, from Twitter um, back in probably 2020 uh, with the pandemic um, raging. And it's tempting to try to know everything or learn everything or tell other people all the things that you know. And the idea of self-care is you can't do that very well if you're depleting all of your energy in the effort to keep up with everything and tell everybody else all the important things that you know. So the idea of self-care is that you center yourself and you make sure that you get enough sleep and you eat well and uh, you attend to your personal needs and you attend to your family needs um, and, and the friends and family around you. Um, and then with the leftover of that, that's when you go out into the world and try to make things better or try to understand what's going on or try to help people. But if you don't start with yourself, um, you're, you're going to run yourself ragged um, and not help anybody. So you really need to center and take care of yourself first. Thanks. Yeah, I think I had my hand up next. Uh, going into the information fire hose and being overwhelmed with information, uh, I would just like to emphasize what I put in the chat that I think it serves, sometimes serves a very important purpose. So for me, I'm an information junkie and I'm in all kinds of uh, filter bubbles with online uh, feeds that repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, this is the blueprint for change. This is the only way we can change. How can we ever change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what it does to me, it forces me to stop and think, what do I really think about this? Why is this even important to me? Do I have my own ideas, uh, sometimes fed by what I read, but often just fed by the frequency of the headline of a certain item? So I do think there is something to be uh, said for sometimes being in the uh, uh, overwhelmed by information fire hose uh, frame of uh, mind.
Judy, is your hand up? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was supposed to get recognized. <clears throat> um, I think you, he, Jerry's muted. I think you can go. <laughs> Uh, yes, I apologize. I was just trying to explain. Judy, I will not recognize people. Just uh, add in however much silence you feel is needed at the time and then just jump in. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share an experience I had a long time ago, maybe a decade-ish, but I had a serious illness that could have been threatening and, and I made it through and somebody said in the hospital to a colleague, you know, don't worry about her. She's a fighter. And I wasn't aware of what it was that was fighting. It was something not under conscious control for sure. Um, but it, that episode caused me to do some reflection and simply put where I ended up was, I'm gonna spend my time doing things that give me joy or bring good to the world or bring other people joy. And it, it wasn't an intellectual evaluation, it was a feeling evaluation. Um, but it's been a helpful reminder in the decorator so since then, because we are overloaded with situations. I love puzzles, so I read all the news and <clears throat> try to discern from competing sources, which is more accurate, which is maybe not the best use of my time, but it gives me a sense of, at least I tried to figure it out. And so I think we're all in an interesting space and time because the world is providing us far more information than it ever has in the past at a very fast pace. It's hard to determine the quality of the information. And then there's the whole dynamic of how does it affect me or you and how are we going to do something about it or do we want to learn more about it to know if there's something that could be done and so on. So this is not much of a statement, but it's sort of an endorsement of the process that we're engaging in. Thank you. I'm appreciating the silence like many of us are. I'm also appreciating the rhythm of the conversation, the pace that the silence is bringing to the conversation. And it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's shining a light for me on Klaus's comments earlier of the, um, the fire hose. And um, Hans, what you said about um, um, you know, actively selecting where to pay your attention. I had this image earlier on in the conversation of, you know, I'm I'm navigating a ship on stormy seas. I don't need to know everything. I don't even need to know everything about the seas. I need to know what I need to know. Um, and we seem to have, I include me in the we, um, Ken's disciplined me to always be careful when I say we. Um, so the, the we that includes me, um, fascinated at why why do I think I need to pay attention to everything what is that um you know it seems to be a cultural um, addiction that's been you know that's been developed in us and maybe I don't and so that's the beauty we're, we're you know we're sort of modeling in this process an answer to Klaus's question of how to deal with the overload is to slow it down um, um, be much more selective in where we pay attention. Um, we need to map the whole thing, and um, you know, put our own put our own oxygen mask on first before assisting others. That's um, a funny back back to Ken in the Tour de France. It's a funny metaphor of like doing what's right in front of us, step at a time, but also not looking down at our feet. We're like. Um, thank you, Gil.
as a um, independent consultant and um, at a few times a paid consultant, um, basically being sent to places that would not pay, you know, three hundred dollars an hour for someone to come in unless there was a sorry um, horse five fuck up involved that's what I needed to come in and do the things that the other software consultants couldn't do look people in the eye drink information from a fire hose prioritize it make sure that all the stakeholders from the people with no power to the people who basically saying we're going to make the people with no power do this and i'm kind of saying well the people with no power basically say that you're going to destroy the company if you make this choice <laughs> because they know how things work and you know how things want to happen but we've got to take it slowly so we don't cause a chaotic disruption um, so drinking information from a fire hose is something that I learned early on, and I find it to be a incredible skill. And my, you know, I just take notes in real time and be able to go back to them and extend them, um, and then you know share what I think in terms of what the specification should be, and then you know go through the um, incremental refinement to make sure that all the stakeholders agree. Um, and can understand that specification. Anyway, um, as to what Judy was saying, yes, I've been through many mortality moments, um, uh, illnesses, et cetera, and just heard about two months ago that, um, you know, there's a great, wonderful um, number of books about people who are survivors, um, who survived this sinking or this airplane crash and who didn't. Um, uh, in terms of fighting and surviving from illness, the insight I got a couple months ago was people who took agency for their own healing, as opposed to, I'm going to let the doctor do everything, um, were the people who um, were most likely to survive. <laughs> Thrive. Thank you. Thanks everybody for the silence. It really is looking for a nice pace. Um, um, I was a little late, so I'm not sure where we started and if there's a kind of definition to the you know frame around what we're, we're talking about. But um, a number of times the um, the the two concepts of one, the info flood, the fire hose, the, the tsunami um, that we're um, faced with has come up and um, that personally and professionally is um, somewhat of an obsession of mine um, just thinking about how one faces that um, mindfully and the, the importance of creating um, creating filters and and this is you know both both metaphorically speaking and practically, you know, technologically speaking, um not subjecting oneself to um the flood as as chosen by others not you um you know if, if there, there are so many of us who i think 
are at least at times faced with this this binary choice, this on off for the flood, you know, this the and the sense that okay, I'm gonna take a digital Sabbath and and you know put my devices in the box, or I'm not gonna do these things at this time as if they're resigned to their their time and the digital or the information accessible um, space being being a flooding as opposed to being um, being focused as they want it to be focused, not as as somebody else does. And the other phrase that relates to this that's come up a few times in passing is paying attention and what you pay attention to. And I am so glad that that is a normal turn of phrase um, that, you know, if we, that we, everybody says without thinking, but if we really parse it to think of, you know, our attention as, as many of us do, I think, as a limited and valuable commodity of ours, you know, part of our capital as, as humans and the ways in which we pay it are are very powerful, not just for our own sanity, but also, you know, their their votes. Um, they're, you know, allowing ourselves to pay an attention for clickbait that comes to us in the info flood is 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 transferring capital to the corporations that sell advertising against that clickbait. And, you know, we're, we're just making a free contribution to that model. Um, and working on ways, as I am, to, to filter the info flood and, um, and focus selectively in different ways. It's not just like an overall filter. I mean, now I want to filter this. Now I want to filter for that. Uh, now I want to focus here. Now I want to turn it off completely. Is a right, a human right that that people should have, and not this forced taxation of their attention that the attention that they pay um, that we're going through right now. And um, I'm eager to talk to anybody who wants to talk about this anytime because it's it's a passion um thanks So I know a lot of you are, are steeped in technology and technology is a, a wonderful, extraordinary thing for sharing information. But I think that um, technology, uh, and this was just stimulated and you talk about being in conversation and dialogue. This was just stimulated by what Michael said at the end of that, you know, human right not to be flooded with information. Um, the idea that technology has taken us away from our humanity. You know, it's, it's a great tool in certain ways, but it's also, it also kind of um, has moved us away from our, 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 our human connection to others. Um, I think the idea of, of um, input of information flood, it's a function of one's own ecology and emotional intelligence and um, self-managing the amount of, of data and information that you can actually take in. Um, I usually, um, when I'm working at home, turn the, turn the news on. It's usually MSNBC or CNN. You know, uh, during lunchtime, I turned it on yesterday. And um, both of those stations were broadcasting um, the funeral for Memphis, which was, um, my initial reaction was, no, I can't take any more of this, but I listened for a while. And um, it, it was very powerful um, at a very, very human level, in, in, including Nicole Wallace, who was 
practically in tears as she was trying to facilitate um, a panel. And then I just uh, <laughs> I decided to to wonder what was Fo what was Fox doing, and they were talking about Tom Brady's retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I just it, it's just it's incredulous and absolutely incredulous and that's happened kind of a few times so I think we each have to kind of manage our own information flow depending upon our, our own um, our own personal um, ecology um, it's kind of like what um, uh, Mark said about you know the people who survived are the ones who took care of themselves um and i see that in so many situations um and gil thanks for reminding me of uh, richard moss's great book the eye that is we <laughs> oh and i'm receiving poetry books today uh, uh, 25 poetry books so I'm, I'm kind of um excited about that that's my that's my my piece of checking and i've gotten about 15 um pre-publication endorsements that um that i'm really excited and i actually learned a, a bunch in terms of what people's commentary was Yeah, if I may shift direction for a moment, I was in a quirky conversation uh, in the Washington Post forum uh, the other day, and it was about the protests now uh, in Britain, in the United Kingdom, you know, pretty significant, uh, uh, massive uh, uh, protests, social unrest uh, driven. And it, the, the comments came back to Brexit, how much damage Brexit has done to the British economy, and in particular to the working class uh, in, in Britain. So I was making a comment that uh, Brexit, the core reason for Brexit was really the changes in the European Union banking regulations, which forced transparency into uh, international money transactions, and then you think that the British economy, over 30% of their GDP, is derived in these financial markets around London. And the British absolutely didn't want to engage, uh, couldn't afford really to, uh, to su uh, submit to these uh, banking regulations. So I wanted to, to I, I mentioned you know, that I remember something reading about this. So I went to ChatGPT and I asked ChatGPT the question, uh, how, the, how did the changes in European banking regulations impact Brexit? You know, have they been a cause to Brexit? And what I got back was invalid question. And so I, I modified the question and I said, what, what are the, the how does uh, the European banking regulation force transparency into, into international money transfers? Got an amazing report back about very specifically how uh, the European Union has introduced banking with code names, you know, the articles uh, referenced and everything, how the uh, European banking regulations are forcing uh, basically applying blockchain technology to uh, 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 to track financial transactions from the start to finish so total transparency and what it what it told me is that um, chat GPT will not make uh, will not give you an opinion but my first question was, really wanting to get an opinion. And uh, the response was uh, invalid question. But then when I came back with, with uh, wanting to have a piece of knowledge that supported my theory, then that uh, uh, turned out fine. So the, and the, the, the 
connections, right? These systemic connections we have to make ourselves, but the information to get to these connections, chat GPT uh, is an amazing tool to take a deep dive in what you're looking for. Yeah, so I don't know, every year we kind of start out with all these things we want to try to get done. Um, I've just been incredibly dis discouraged because I feel like I've got a lot of ideas that, are kinda, that should be good enough to gain some traction, but I'm just not. So um, one of the things I'm doing and going back to basics is looking at some of the time strategies when I can get... Um, to some of the conversations like what Michael was saying, but there's a 90-91 rule, which uh, for the first 90 minutes of, um, for 90 days, you spend the first 90 minutes of your day focusing on the one huge idea you've got, um, literally shut off everything, no distractions, just focus on that. Um, the second is the uh, idea, well, the getting things done. I've been tr trying to implement it for many years, but I things are not well defined enough. So it's very, it's very difficult to manage it. But there's the two minute rule. So if it's two minutes or less, you should just do it. And I when I was doing a search, I actually found a found a video that talks, that explains the 90-91 rule in two minutes. <laughs> it's kind of combining the two. And then the third technique I've been looking at is the um, Pomodoro technique, which probably a lot of people might've heard of. It's basically time blocking for 25 minutes at a time. But what I've been doing, is I've also kind of come up with the concept of a, um, making it an unproject. So I just, I set my, I set my timer for 25 minutes. And just, even if I get, when it goes off, then I just hit the re, um, the, um, to, to do it again, you're supposed to take like a five minute break, but I just, sorry, either I continue for another 25 or if I take a break, it can't be more than 25 minutes kind of thing, but I'm calling that an unproject. And my thought is that um, you kind of, well, I should be developing almost an innate sense of what 25 minutes is. So if I, well, like, if I ever do really want to try to implement the Commodore technique, I, I, it should be pretty easy for me. So I'll send a couple, I'll post a couple of things and I'll look to write something up for the, for the, um, for the group chat and stuff. <laughs> no, I'd say uh, I've got way too many projects, <laughs> if anything. So that's part of it too, is finding oh, out. In fact, the, almost the reason doing I said that, that Carl? Uh -huh. what, was that it's what what you said was that none of them seem to be taking off. None of them seem to be, and and so for me it felt like, mm -hmm. okay, if you had a list of all the things, you still aren't feeling drawn to any of it. And that's why I, why I said that is is that a comment that you had made at the beginning? Uh, well, actually, so is, is part, it a matter of you don't have enough time, or it's, um, or it's well, it's um. Well, it's also trying to, um, well, what I'm doing for my 90 minutes is really trying to seek out those, like the strategic leverage points and what is, you know, what it, if you can, well, I hate, I hate that about killing two birds with one stone, but I that, like knocking, knocking down multiple um, bowling pins or whatever. So it's not quite as, but what are the, what are the things? I mean, I I come up with things, but I mean, when I, when I said it's, I guess part of it's finding the right, like a small group of people that are also on that particular 
that one thing is important enough for them to uh, go in. I mean, for, for work, I've been in the strategic planning and process improvement. So it's basically, and I'm trying to develop a contributions impact framework as my dissertation. So I'm like, I guess I'm fight, fighting the battle of the, the um, law, the law of irony um, somewhat, but um, so it's every, so much of what I'm trying to do, it's either trying to get something new to get done and even you know, I work in the federal government, but it, you know, like it's, oh, it, you know, it's not funded. It's like, you want to, process improvement and you want to try to change the way we're doing it. Nobody wants to hear that either, or that we should stop doing something we've been doing. So it's kind of, as I said, it just kind of a, kind of a very, um, as I said, it just kind of a really discourage, discouraging time, but I'm trying to see how I can um, try to change strategies and stuff. The, what I've been doing is not working, so trying to figure out what will work, get some traction. Wanted to share something that uh, that I happened to bump into uh, today. Uh, interesting little thread of knowledge that I knew parallel things about, but I didn't happen to know this this vein. Um, probably some of you do. Maybe that you learned it before me. Um, it started with a thread on Mastodon uh, from um, from somebody who happens to be black that I happen to follow for no reason other than he seems like an interesting interesting person, and um, and he told a, a story that I know already, but uh, in ways that I didn't. Um, so he starts off, you know, I'm, I'm still not ready. Happy Black History Month. Still not ready to talk about Black history. I want to talk, talk about white US history. And he's he gives a question, why don't Black people build any generational wealth? Uh, New immigrant groups seem to be doing just fine. Um, must be lazy and shiftless people. And of course, the story of the US is that um, over and over and over and over, white people come and destroy generational wealth of black people over and over and over in really cruel and, and difficult and mean ways. And then whitewash over it and pretend it didn't happen and never talk about it again. Um, there's a lot of structural uh, stuff to that. And I know a fair bit of this story. I, I mean, I haven't experienced the story in my, in my personal life. It would frustrate the hell out of me. Um, but I know a little bit. I know that, that white people have been doing this to black people for hundreds of years. And one of the people I've learned that from is Kevin Jones, who's working to kind of restore some of the, the balance there. Um, anyway, in, in the course of um, Mecca's thread, um, somebody else posted a link to, um, hey, um, uh, there's a cool thing about the land of the Blacks uh, in what is now Manhattan um, back in the 1600s and early 1700s. And so that was an interesting thing to read about, that there were um, Black and slave people in the 16, 1600s in uh, New York, and, and that there was a fair amount of general wealth, generational wealth that got created right after that as the Dutch were fighting and the English were fighting. Um, the Black people got a little bit of, you know, um, uh, not justice, but at least relief uh, from being under the thumb of, of people. Uh, and then that uh, brought me to uh, the link about half free, uh, which is a mind blowing concept in and of itself. Um, and that I ended up on the page, uh, History of Slavery in New York, uh, which, you know, goes, I mean, I, I have thought generally, I mean, I've, I've known that there uh, were slaves in the North, um, but I kind of think of uh, slave history as a Southern thing. And so it's interesting reading um, about the history of slavery in New York too. Thanks.
Um, Mike, you've just joined the conversation. I'll just explain our process for a sec because it'll be confusing. Um, Stacy suggested at the start, and we're basically raising our hands to step in the queue if we think we have something to say that follows what was being said. Each speaker is um, starting with some silence, which is what you stepped into right now, um, as long as they feel is appropriate. And then um, that's how we're going through the call. And originally this was a check-in format, but then we just kind of munged it into the call format. So I think we'll keep going this way. Thank you. You're that welcome, does explain Mike. more. <laughs> Greetings from Palm Springs. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Pete. Uh, you reminded me, um, well, geez, it was 2004 when I saw the incomplete film, I believe it's since been completed, called, um, what was it? Uh, Traces of the Trade, which was about uh, families in Bristol, Connecticut. Bristol made its fortune. Bristol was one of the most po uh, prosperous cities in the United States during the slave trade. And it was every single person in the city was involved in some way in the slave trade from the guys who made the uh, stays for the barrels, you know, that would hold the, the rum and whatnot, and just everybody. And uh, uh, one group of um, people decided that they were going to actually face this and they were going to, you know, look at um, the, the, the family history of slavery and own it and, and do a deep dive. And it caused huge division because um, people were like, no, don't touch that. That's in the past. We don't want to deal with that. And there's a scene where they actually go to Ghana and um, they ask uh, some Africans there, you know, we're here from, we're, we're, we're descendants of slave traders and we're trying to make amends and we came to talk to you. And, you know, uh, and the woman very wisely said, you're not ready to talk to us. You need to go back and talk among yourselves and decide what is it you want to ask us? What is it you want to know? Why are you coming to speak with us? Because right now you're just coming to, to say, we recognize that we're descendants of slave traders and we want to feel better about ourselves, but you haven't done the inner work to actually figure out why. And I think for Black History Month, one of the best things we could do uh, as, and I hate to say white people because white and black from a biological standpoint don't exist, but culturally we're white people is to say, what, what do I, want to own about whatever my ancestors have done and how do I want to engage in a conversation with other white people about that? And then how might we have a really productive and useful conversation with black people who are the descendants of slaves? Um, so I think that would be much better than simply just, you know, saying, oh, I read a biography of, you know, James Baldwin or Harriet Tubman or whatever, it would be a little bit uh, uh, more challenging. Thanks, Ken, um, a lot. I found it ironic yesterday on the first day of Black History Month that the news was about DeSantis making sure that the AP curriculum no longer includes African-American studies, blah, 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 blah. He's basically on a culture war uh, that's exactly the opposite of this. Uh, ADOS is adult uh, descendants of slavery um, in the chat. And I wanted to read Nikki Giovanni's <clears throat> poem titled BLK or Black History Month. And uh, it's short and it goes as follows. If Black History Month is not viable, then wind does not carry the seeds and drop them on fertile ground. Rain does not dampen the land and encourage the seeds to root sun does not warm the earth and kiss the seedlings and tell them plain, you're as good as anybody else. You've got a place here too. And I'll close by mentioning, uh, here's the link to the poem. Um, I'll close by mentioning my favorite book on the topic that Ken was bringing up about how everybody North and South was complicit in slavery. 
in the run-up to the Civil War, uh, which is the American Slave Coast, uh, written by a couple uh, who are super interesting. And it has a, a bunch of really fascinating assertions. I'll put a link to my brain notes of, of about the book in the chat. Uh, I don't want to take us into that territory right now uh, further, but uh, I learned a lot. I thought I, I thought I was reasonably informed and read on the topic and learned a whole bunch from that book. With that, I'm complete. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Saturday, February or January 21st, got a call in the morning from Iris saying, um, Elliot Porter, Elliot Einzig Porter, EEP, was in the hospital in Santa Fe. And um, the uh, uh, doctors, the, the nurses Googled to find that he had been married to her and um, called her. And so she was calling me if I knew anybody who could allow the hospital to pull the plug. Later, after again, Saturday party, we are out at a restaurant around 11 at night and got the, uh, um message that he died that af that afternoon um elliot uh lived in berkeley a lot um was a uh immense researcher very difficult person um he discarded friends um he was somebody who deeply loved things and people but he could not accept himself being deeply loved or any form of tough love and so i was discarded as a friend for over two two and a half decades um you know i uh, had a restaurant conversation um about four years ago and you know part for the course didn't didn't really bother me but um his death is uh something that is tragic in terms of losing so much potential um I could go into the books that he was writing and researching. Um, but now I find myself as one of the only people who can, or is willing to protect his legacy. Um, so let me turn this video off again. Sorry. I'm looking for the mouse. I can't find it. Um, oh, because I'm not moving the mouse pad. I'm moving my fingers on the table. There we go. Um, so if anybody knows what to do, um, somebody who died in Santa Fe with no will, um, how not to, you know, how to find next of kin. Uh, we're very, very distant from him. You know, all that mess, uh, if anybody's gone through kind of handling someone else's death is, um, you know, boy, um, I've been making phone calls to county clerks and and uh, Ted Nelson was a good friend of uh, Elliot's as well, um, and uh, told me, you know, the names of his book projects. And um, uh, he's offered to, um, you know, pay for a lawyer, um, which is incredibly kind. Um, but um, I'm looking for help. Um, and if anybody of you knew Elliot, you know, I'm sorry. Um, it's just tragic. Um, thank you. I can't add a lot, but I've just been executor for two of my uncles who passed away. Um, in one case, we didn't find the will for nine months, um, but there is help. Um, the state lawyers by state law can only take so much money out of the estate. Um, and there is a wonderful book. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's called Executorship for dummies or maybe it's just, or just how to be an executor and it's part of the dummies 
uh, series. And it, it's actually very good. It goes step by step. You know, how do you find people? How do you find if there's any debt that needs to be paid off? I mean, there's a lot of things there. Unfortunately, we don't have this other question answered very well. You know, how do you preserve the legacy and how do you winnow out all the paper and all the floppy drives and everything else that's the the digital detritus so i i, I uh, sympathize with what you're going through but uh, get a good estate lawyer and ask around um everybody's had a relative who's died and they probably can point you to people to avoid and people to find but I, i've just spent three years with this hanging over my head and i'm almost done and i you don't get paid much for being executor, but you do have the satisfaction of making sure all the loose ends are tied up. The worst part is often the IRS because you have to fill out paperwork, you know, fill out the, the final tax form. And often you have no idea where to find the, the right uh, financial information, bank accounts and things like that. But thanks for stepping up in this case. That's that's noble. Um, may this cup be passed from me. Um, yeah, um, looking for someone willing to willing to take point. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, just to um, to pick up on that theme in my um, in my walk through the legal profession and in my personal life, um, you know, I'd done some estate work. Um, <laughs> in my quest to find an area of the law that would keep me satisfied. <laughs> I never quite found it. But anyway, um, the, the, the folks within the county probate office are often great help. And when someone dies without a will slash intestate is the technical legal term, um, you have an administrator and not an executor. And there are certain people who are entitled to apply for that, usually, you know, blood relatives, but then there's a, you know, a, um, <clears throat> uh, a, a list of where it goes from there. Um, but the, the, the folks at the, at the county probate office are often extremely helpful. And then there are a lot of pro se people who go in um, without a lawyer. Um, so, you know, those are just some, some things to think about, Mark. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Stuart. My uh, mother died without a will and, uh, my sister was the administrator and it was a harrowing family trauma process, but, um, doesn't have to be. So, um, so I wanted to go back to the um, to the uh, African American theme and, uh, that we were talking about, and um, a really meaningful book was published about I don't know two or three years ago um, called Black Fatigue by Mary Frances Winters, and it really pointed to the fact that you know. Um, people often turn to black people uh, and they're just tired of trying to uh, <laughs> inform white people of, of, of this whole milieu of kind of moving beyond um, racism. Um, it's just exhausting and it's not their problem in some ways. Um, it's our problem. Um, and so the, the whole idea of being vigilant anti-racists I think is up to all of the Caucasian people in the world so that we can kind of get beyond um, that way of thinking. Um, as, a, as a curiosity, I happened to watch uh, the brand new um, uh, Jonah Hill, uh, any Murphy movie, um, <laughs> which, you know, is very stereotypical, but yet, you know, it pointed ultimately, I think, pointed to the fact that we we all have more similarities than differences 
even though we're in you know different pitch camps and that 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 people tend to step in um yeah uh, there was something else i wanted to say but it's just uh, uh maybe it'll, maybe it'll maybe it'll come back but um i think it's important to just for all of us to take responsibility um you know it's a it's a conversation we thought that we were over in some ways but all of a sudden it has just raised its ugly head in the world in um uh in ways that are almost unbelievable almost unbelievable um you know i think it's kind of the last the last gasp of um uh, uh, of, of a segment of the population that wants to maintain its superiority by thinking uh, less of uh, others. Thank you, Stuart. Um, when I'm done, I want to pass to Kim so he can read the poem because, before he has to leave the room. But um, two things. One, uh, as you were talking about the last gasp, uh, Stuart, I'm just pondering how many times there have been efforts to get rid of racism, bias, sexism, and so forth in society, ours and others, and how if on the on the one hand, there has been a whole bunch of progress. I mean, the pill is 1961. Women wearing pants in the US is right around that era, 72, 78, somewhere in there, that, that it was okay for women to wear pants to work. That this shit is within our lifetimes. Um, it's amazing. And and I'm sometimes just boggled, just boggled at how persistent all this crap is. And the cynical perspective on this is that this is just human nature, that people will always seek difference and denigrate the other. Uh, and the other point of view is that this is in fact uh, resolvable in some way, and I don't know exactly what. Uh, but I was uh, troubled by this recently. And so I, I have a tab in my browser open at the site that I use for buying domains and I'm seeking opinions in this room on whether I should purchase, th this is probably a very stupid idea, but I was going to purchase yowhitemen.com uh, because I have in my brain two different thoughts. I have uh, Black Lives Matter is white people's problem and Me Too is men's problem. That the Me Too, the women are the victims and it's not up to them to fix it. It's up to the people who victimize them to fix it. And the same thing goes for Black Lives Matter and other movements to recognize people of color and figure all this stuff out. Um, and so I don't know if it's a stupid idea, but I'd love to figure out the, the idea of buying the domain, which of course is not a way to solve world problems, merely an outlet for um, uh, frustration and creativity. Uh, but the idea was to just create resources to actually talk to white men who might be convincible that their bias doesn't really work. And one of my heroes on this is Gerald Davis, uh, a black jazz pianist who um, has a garage full of KKK robes. And I've talked about him before. I interviewed him. I haven't finished transcribing the interview. Uh, Stacy, I still need to get back to that. Uh, but I did a lovely hour long uh, recording with him. Uh, I think it was on, even an hour and a half about, about this. And what he says is, how how can you hate me if you don't even know me? Which is the simplest, simplest of questions. And it's really a beautiful question. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested in, in doing more around this topic. And from what I'm seeing in the chat, maybe I should buy you know, whitemen.com and see what we can do. And anybody who feels like uh, jumping in on this with me, uh, please LMK, send me email. Let's chat, uh, see if this turns into anything. But I'm extremely interested in this topic because I feel like um, it's not up to the victims to solve this. 
these different systemic societal issues, it's up to the perps. And modern perps who may not have physically done something are as responsible for their ancestry as anybody around. And nobody else is going to sort of pick up that role. Thank you, Jerry. Um, it's interesting. I had a poem I wanted to read last week that I didn't have time for because I now have a, a call that starts at, I've asked him to start at 935, so I have a little break between calls so that'll go on for the next 18 months. Um, and I was going to read that today, but now that we've been talking about this, I have decided to switch. I'm going to read a different poem. This is called The Idea of Ancestry by Etheridge Knight. I don't know if anyone knows Etheridge Knight. He was a very powerful poet. He used to be the poet in residence for Robert Bly's uh, men's gatherings. Um, Taped to the wall of my cell are 47 pictures, 47 black faces. My father, mother, grandmothers, one dead. Grandfathers, both dead. Brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, first and second nieces and nephews. They stare across the space at me sprawling on my bunk. I know their dark eyes, they know mine. I know their style, they know mine. I am all of them, they are all of me. They are farmers, I'm a thief. I am me, they are thee. I have at one time or another been in love with my mother one grandmother, two sisters, two aunts, one went to the asylum, and five cousins. I am now in love with a seven-year-old niece. She sends me letters in large block print, and her picture is the only one that smiles at me. I have the same name as one grandfather, three cousins, three nephews, and one uncle. The uncle, was disappear the uncle disappeared when he was 15, just took off and caught a freight they say. He's discussed each year when the family has a reunion. He causes uneasiness in the clan. He is an empty space. My father's mother, who is 93 and who keeps the family Bible with everybody's birth dates and death dates in it, always mentions him. There is no place in her Bible for whereabouts unknown. Each fall, the graves of my grandfathers call me the brown hills and red gullies of Mississippi send out their electric messages, galvanizing my genes. Last year, like a salmon quitting the cold ocean, leaping and bucking up his birth stream, I hitchhiked my way from L.A. with 16 caps in my pocket and a monkey on my back. And I almost kicked it with the kinfolks. I walked barefooted in my grandmother's backyard. I smelled the old land and the woods. I sipped corn whiskey from fruit jars with the men. I flirted with the women. And I had a ball until the caps ran out and my habit came down. That night, I looked at my grandmother and split. My guts were screaming for junk. But I was almost contented. I had almost caught up with me. The next day in Memphis, I cracked a croaker's crib for a fix. This year, there's a gray stone wall damming my stream. And when the falling leaves stir my jeans, I pace my cell or flop on my bunk and stare at the 47 black faces across the space. I am all of them. They are all of me. I am them. They are thee. And I have no children to float in the space between. Ciao, y'all. Mike, are you jumping in? And feel free to, and you and Michael can sort of take us out of the call if you want to stay in the queue. Mike Nelson, I mean.
If not, uh, Michael, it's yours. Mike had nothing to say, but you cut him off. Um, I'm not sure he's hearing me. Okay. Um, I was, um, it's tough to call, follow that, that, uh, that poem. That was, that was wonderful. Um, and, um, but I will say what I was going to say in relation to um, something that Stuart mentioned about the, I don't remember how he put it, but just the, the raising of awareness of the lack of an end of racism and the resistance to um, reckoning, um, you know, particularly by white people and particularly by white men. Um, it's just, I feel like that what's new is the, the idea that ending racism and, and sexism includes, hey, it's, it's not just don't use this word and don't, you know, engage in this behavior from now on, but, you know, recognize residual benefits and privileges of what's, what's happened before you, um, you know, be willing to engage with the idea of restorative justice, um, reparations, you know, whatever case. And, and also, I feel like racism is kind of a misnomer in that the difference between you know discrimination against just anybody and and differentiation of, of just anybody based on the shade of their skin is one thing and is racism and then talking about the injustices and and um you know, the enslavement, the genocide, the cultural erasure, the cross-generational theft visited on the specific group of enslaved, you know, abducted Black Americans and, um, and indigenous people here and other places, it's, it, there's, there's, that's more than racism and that's more that's more than you know i mean this is something for your your page jerry um that's something that I, I i don't think people you know i'm sure most people in this room have an understanding of that but i think the you know the we had a We've, we've had a black president crowd, um, some of whom are very well-meaning and don't have any you know, racist practices now are, are, not, are just now being confronted with that, that longer view and are you know, lumping it as critical race theory and what Ron DeSantis thinks shouldn't be taught and you know, it's reverse racism or something uh, and it's, it's just not it's just, yeah you know, i'm preaching to the choir probably but that was what i wanted to say to Stuart's expression of newness thank you michael um we're at our time i think a nice way to end this call would be to go into silence and then just drop off as we as we wish to as we find we are moved to so Stacy thank you for recommending this process it's worked really well I think it's going to find its way into our check-in calls a lot
Bill's note taker is a hearty companion. Uh, what fathom <laughs> note taker? Yeah. Ask him about that. Exactly. Well, first on, and I guess almost last off. <laughs> So thank you. Great. Thanks, Ralph. And there you are. Yeah, I'll, I'll be. Um, I've got a lot of ideas about the um, using brain and stuff too. I've got. I've got team brain licenses that I'm not leveraging the way it's possible. So I'll have to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that was interesting was I was looking at that, um, the talk you did with uh, Shelly and Matt and Mark about COVID and stuff. So I think one of the things we could do is almost have, there could, Maybe we could come up with a template that would be spokes to your hub kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. that where people can be linking to to various parts of your your brain. And then he was showing it as the notes page with what they're doing now. Right. Um, and stuff. So and I think they're shortly going to release something that might make that a lot easier. I don't know. Yeah, what Har make it better. Harlan's fine. Yeah. Harlan's fat, um, passionate about like addressing the web interface. Finally. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. The, the number one thing I have is I want them to have an option to like if with getting things done is to just do a, brain box to zero one click i make everything that's in my brain box make it a child thought of like my in i use an inbox tag and stuff so it's pretty cool because then you click on anything and it's a thought by itself on the screen so you, right. you can kind of focus on just that one thought of thing so cool Okay, well, great, great talking with you. And yeah, as I said, it felt good to kind of vent a little. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Same here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hope you find your pace. Okay, thanks. Thanks.